All right, hi everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm Carly Andres. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the North Dakota Brain Injury Network. Most of you I am familiar with. Um, and most of you have been to Web Wednesday before, but just a quick review, uh, if you are wanting CEUs at all uh, for this presentation, there will be a link up probably by the end of the workday tomorrow with a CEU request and the recording from today available. And then you can um, just fill out that CEU request and get it back to me. And I will get you those CEUs within about, um, give me a couple of days usually. Um, we do have webinar Wednesdays scheduled now all the way through November 17th. So keep joining us every other Wednesday from here on out, except for next week. We will not be, or not next week, but the week after next of September 22nd. We won't meet that week. Um, the NASHA conference is happening that week. NASHA is the, stands for National Association of State Head Injury Administrator. It's a very lengthy title, but they have their annual conference that week. And um, NDBIN is a member of NASHA. NASHA helps give us a lot of great ideas and helps us with um, research and just a lot of different components of our, of our role in North Dakota. So we will be attending that virtually. So, um, but if you want to attend too, um, there's a, that's an option. There's a link on our website for you to click on and you can check out their speakers and everything. Um, and then we have them, like I said, from October 6th to November 17th, it should work out where we have every other Wednesday filled up. So keep joining us like you have been. Um, but I am excited to have Greg with us today. Greg Little um, is very experienced in this field. He has 37 years of experience working in the mental health field, as well as extensive experience uh, presenting workshops and seminars throughout the United States, uh, has not only taught individuals how to cope with life challenges, but he has lived it. In June of 1972, Greg's life changed forever. Following a horrific automobile accident, he survived a traumatic brain surgery, um, traumatic brain injury, an eight-day coma, weeks of paralysis, and had to relearn how to walk and talk. He is faced with the normal consequences of TBI, such as short-term memory, anxiety and depression, poor impulse control, as well as others. Dr. Little's book, Rise Above, Conquering Adversities, has sold globally and details how he was able to face with the consequences of TBI. This did not always mean overcoming the consequences. However, it often did result in making them manageable. So Greg is joining us today from Mississippi, but in the process of moving to Texas as well. So he's down south, but um, take it away, Greg, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for having me. I would like to discuss my TBI and mention my life after TBI, the, and then, list some consequences of TBI that I have faced and many TBI survivors have, and then answer any questions anyone may have. I uh, want to begin by, by, by stating that I grew up with a severe speech impediment, which I will discuss later on. Um, I graduated high school May 1972. Three weeks after that, June 17th was the date of the Watergate break-in, which has nothing to do with me. But that night, a friend and I drove from our hometown in Corinth, Mississippi, across the state line to the Pickwick Dam, about 23 miles, and met two young ladies at the Pickwick Pickwick Dam and spent the evening throwing the Frisbee. Now my friend was a very good drummer. On the ride home, we stopped, we stopped at two night spots and the bands allowed my friend to sit in and play the drum for two or three songs. We arrived back at his house, his parents' house around one in the morning. I had told my parents, if I don't come back, I may spend the night with friends. 
Well, I got in my car, which is a 1968 Pontiac Le Mans with bucket seats. The type of seats that fold up, but don't fold back. That will be important to remember in a, in a few minutes. I uh, was not wearing my seatbelt. In 1972, seatbelts were not stressed or required like they are now. Besides, why should I wear a seatbelt? I was 17 years old and invincible and little stupid. I was driving very fast. I remember the fog that night was very bad. I turned on to an old country road, which was a shortcut. It ended up being the longest shortcut of my life. About three miles, three miles from my parents' house, my car went off the road on the right side and it threw me up, threw my body up and hit the, I guess hit the rear view mirror. My left eye was bruised shut. The body impact threw my body back so hard that the bucket seats that were not meant to fall back were let the bucket seat was laying flat in the back seat, flat in the back seat. I went across the road. I was in the back seat now and threw my head back and forth and cracked my skull here, here, and here. I was bleeding from my left ear. I took out uh, took out three fence posts and was not found for six hours. The next morning, a farmer found me in his pat pasture and telephoned for an, an, an ambulance. The two young men working the ambulance that night were friends of mine. One, the driver, John Paul, three weeks before, he was my marching partner, partner when we graduated high school. The other young man, Ronnie Jones, and I played boys club baseball together in 1968 and 1969. They took my broken, my broken body out of the car, loaded me in the, am the ambulance and drove me to the hospital in Corinth. At that time, Corinth did not have a neural sur surgeon, which was, which was ob obvious I required. So the hospital uh, called the Baptist Hospital in Memphis to make arrangements for my for my transfer there. A nurse at the hospital who was friends with my parents called my mom and dad and my dad answered the phone and she uh, relayed to them the condition I was in. Of course, my parents were distraught. She had called some friends of ours down the road, Buddy and Kay Bain, before they called, she called my mom and dad so they could bring us to bring my mom and dad to the hospital in Corinth. John Paul, who was the driver, waited a little while and told the staff at the hospital, I'm not going to wait on Greg's mom and dad. Tell them I'm going on, I'm going on. And John Paul, with me, of course, in the back, and the nurse who called my mom and dad with, with me, drove the ambulance to Memphis, the Baptist Hospital, which was 93 miles. He did this in 47 minutes. He told me that his foot never left the floor of the ambulance the entire time. And he saved my life. He and several others, which we will discuss in a moment. When, that, when um, they arrived at the, at the hospital 
in Memphis at the Baptist Hospital, of course. The staff opened the ambulance door and asked him, are you the one from Corinth? And he said, yes. They looked at me and said, you got him here just in time. The next day, I had to have neuro sur surgery to release pressure on my brain. I was in a, I was in a co co coma for eight days. My mother cried for eight days straight. When I regained, when I regained consciousness, I was, I was paralyzed on my left side for two and a half weeks. I could move, open my right eye, move my right arm, my right leg, and move this side of my mouth and couldn't talk at all, couldn't speak. Nothing would come out. I can remember being paralyzed in the hospital, in the Baptist Hospital in Memphis and thought about my speech in, in impediment. I thought, boy, I sure do miss it. And that, I, that that's odd to say it, but it was anyway i guess we don't know what we have have until it's gone perhaps we don't know what we have until it's gone um when i was able when i was able to move all my limbs the being in bed being being paralyzed for two and a half weeks my muscles atrophied and um uh, two peat Two physical th th therapists, PTs, had to literally drag me down the hall of the hospital twice a day to teach me how to walk all over again. My speech slowly came back, but my speech was worse than it was before the wreck. And we will get to that in a moment, too. Um, at one time, I had a fever that was so high, the nursing staff had to pack my, pack my legs and arms in ice. This may sound odd, but the day in the hospital, when I was still in the hospital in Memphis, when I knew I was going to make it was the day it rained. I could see the rain hitting the hitting the window pane outside. And for some reason I knew then I was going to be all right. When I was moved to a private room in the summer of 1972, what do you think I heard on TV all day long? Watergate. Now my wreck happened the day, the night of the day of the Watergate break-in. I had no idea what Watergate was. I asked my brother who at that time was living in Louisiana, in Harvey or Gretna, I don't know. I says, all I hear on TV is Watergate. What is Watergate? He said, you don't know what it is? I said, no. He said, well, Greg, there's a huge gate outside of New Orleans. It holds in the water from Lake Pontchartrain. They're debating to open the gate. If they open the gate, it will flood the city, but it will fertilize the marsh. Now for a split second, I thought, hmm. Then I realized he was uh, putting my leg. After 30, after 30 days at the Baptist Hospital, I was transferred home to the Magnolia, Magnolia Hospital in my hometown of Corinth. I was there 10 more days.
After 10 days, I was discharged. The day I was discharged from the hospital, I was six foot tall and weighed 110 pounds. Now, discharged from the hospital. Lay people think, well, he's discharged, he's fine now. They have no clue. Lay people have no clue about traumatic brain injury and the consequences. I compare having a traumatic brain injury to buying a used car. If you ever bought a used car, one thing you always ask, has it ever been wrecked? Why? Once a car has been wrecked, it's never the same. Now, how can the brain, which is the, C which is the CEO of the entire body, be less sensitive than a pile of metal, iron, and rubber? The first four nights I was home, the sun came up in my room before I could go to sleep. My mother had to call our general practitioner to ask for him to prescribe a sleep aid for, for me. In my rick, I had a torn, in my rick, I had a torn muscle in my back and my left arm was essentially wor worthless. Uh, my mother had the button. Now, I had finished high, high school and all. My mother had to button my shirts and cut my meat and my food for me in order for me to eat it. My short-term me memory is very bad now. It was terrible then. I can recall sitting down for dinner in the evening and think, did I have lunch? Um, for a year or two, the headaches I got after my TBI, I would not wish on my worst enemy. I would turn my head and get sick to my stomach. They were unbelievable. I tried to take a college correspondence course soon after I was soon after I was discharged from the hospital. It was futile, futile. I would read a page. I would get to the second half of the page and have no idea what the first part of the page said. I had to send the correspondence, the correspondence course back. August the 28th of 72, I had to go back to Memphis to see my neural sur surgeon who had prescribed an EEG. After getting the results of the EEG, he told me that I could not drive a car, go to school, or work until the EEGs gave him the results he had to have. So for a few months, I was at the mercy of my mom and dad. My friends had gone off, many had gone off to started college by this time. On December the 13th of 72, I went back to the bed to my, see my neurosurgeon in Memphis who had ordered another EEG. This time he got the results and says, and said, I'm sorry, you can drive a car, go to school and work. He also said, Greg, you're going to be fine. 
I will learn that he, what he should have said to me was, Greg, now you've got to learn to live with it. And I wondered for years why he did not say that. And I found out, which I will get to in a moment. As I mentioned before, lay people have no comprehension of a TBI. They think once you're discharged, everything's fine. It's like a, it's like a broken arm. Once it's healed, once they can't see the break, they think everything's, everything is fine. I have family mem members, that's plural, members, who if I mention my TBI, they will laugh and say, Greg, that was eons, uh, a, eons ago. Since my TBI, even though I've earned three college degrees and conducted workshops and seminars on a national level, I've had to live with poor short-term me memory, poor impulse control, arthritis. Now you may say, what does that have to do with TBI? For a, for a few years, I was on the Mississippi Spinal Cord Injury Traumatic Brain Injury Trust Fund. And there was a, there is a position on the board whose MD is in the spinal cord injury. I don't know, it's a, I don't know the name of the, uh, the correct field to use, but um, he said most people with TBIs get arthritis. Now many people will say, well, Greg, most people get arthritis. No, they don't. Of the general, pop, general population, 24% at some time in their life eventually has arthritis, 24%. People with TBIs, over half. And if you think about the jolt it took on the, the skeletal system for to do what the damage it did to our skulls, it kind of makes it kind of, it does make sense. Problems reading social feed, social feedback, a numbing of emotions. Anxiety, depression, seizures, which I will discuss. I'll discuss all of these in time, but, but fatigue, being tired at the end of the day. In 1984, I was employed as a unit director of two buildings, treating individuals with developmental disabilities. This required me to supervise, supervise 40 to 50 staff members because my speech affected my ability to carry out my job. Vocational rehab paid for me to go to speech therapy one hour per week for one year at the University Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. My first meeting with my speech path path pathologist, speech pathologist, Mr. Former, who knew nothing about my past, who knew nothing about my past, said, I can detect in your speech a slight form of dysarthria. Did you ever have a head injury? I said, yes. He said, I thought so. I thought to myself, this is the speech therapist I want to have. Now I went there because 
all my life, I, will, I told and I thought I stutter. I went there for him to treat my stutter. He said, you don't really stutter, you clutter. I clutter, which means I talk too fast. He said it cannot be cured, but it can be controlled. He then gave to me the six rules of good speech. Now, people with TBIs, this will help gr a great deal. Many people have dysarthria and don't even know it. I didn't know it. I'm going to share these six rules now. Even if you don't have a speech issue, these six rules can enhance your speech. And some may sound ob ob obvious to some people, but it um, but not to people with speech issues. Number one is to think. Think about what you say before you say it. Now, I was also taught years ago, one way to enhance my speech is to pause. And thinking can require you to pause. Number two is to breathe. Talk when you exhale rather than when you inhale. Now this may sound obvious to people who don't have speech issues, but sometimes people with speech issues will talk, and I've seen them do it when they inhale rather than when they exhale. Number three is to move your mouth. This will help with articulation Number four is to make all sounds, especially make the last sound of each word. You can listen to news reporters on TV and you can detect the last sound of each word they say. Number five is to use enough voice. This is really, really important. There have been people who I know and some that you know of who've overcome their stutter by using enough voice. The actor James Earl Jones, who was the voice of Darth Vader and was in the, the movie, The Field of Dreams, stutters. I didn't say, I did not say stuttered, I said stutters. From age 10 to 14, James Earl Jones essentially did not talk. His speech was that bad. But an English, English tea teacher taught him to read poetry using a full voice. And by doing that, he overcame his stutter. Ironically, last night, I was doing a run through of this webinar. When I was talking about this to myself, I heard James Earl Jones voice. I looked at my TV and he was doing an ad for Major League Baseball. John Wayne, the actor, stuttered. He said, talk slow, talk low, and don't say very much. If you watch John Wayne's movies, you'll notice that his lines were often very brief. He didn't have it, didn't, he already, hardly ever had a long dialogue. And last but not least, number six is talk slow. My speech therapist told me in order for my speech to sound no, normal to the listener, it must sound abnormal to me. The next day, I went back to work. And once a month, 
I chaired a treatment team meeting at work. We would meet at the salon table in um, staff development or where, wherever it was. I would sit at the head of the table and the other and the other di disciplines would sit along either side of the touch of the table, of course. I began to speak. I could literally see people's mouths drop. My speech had improved that much in one day and they were shocked. The last day of speech ther therapy, speech therapy, my speech therapist had me read a page about George the Rat. A full length, uh, it was a page long story about George the Rat. And I did a rather good job. At the end, he said, I want you to listen to this. He pushed the play button. It was of some kid trying to read the same article. It was to me, obvious, this kid has cerebral, pul cerebral pul pul palsy and some physical abnormality. It, his voice made my skin crawl. This is the truth. At the end, he pushed the stop button. I said, my gosh, who was that? I will go to my grave remembering his next words. He said, that was you, your first day of therapy. My speech had improved that much. I did not recognize myself. Now, by using the six rules of good speech, I've been able to conduct workshops and seminars on a national level. The workshop that I initially uh, would, it would present most of the time was called Planning Qual Quality of Life in Long-Term Care. It's for people who work in patient activities and social ser services in nursing homes. The one that I do that is requested the most now is called Laughter a serious medicine. The first one. Greg, can I stop you for a second and ask, someone's asking what you mean by a full voice. Can you kind of oh, 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 yes, yes. Like this. <laughs> like deep, That's right? That's what it's I mean. And I, that was a good reminder. I need to do that. And that would help, that would help, help me. Does that make sense, Skip? Skip asked that. It's just kind of more confidence, even a confident voice, kind of. Like it does, yeah. Uh, David Muir on uh, what C C CBS News has a full voice. All of them do, but he has a very good voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it just kind of means more accentuated and just more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like well, James Earl Jones has a, has a very you know the very full voice, the actor, right? James Earl Jones. Thank you. Anything sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. What? And I didn't hear what you said. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but you you keep oh, no, going. No, 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 okay. please. Okay. Uh, the first one, the first workshop the planning quality of life and long-term care i would no i would normally do a six hour or 12 hour pre presentation six hours was one day and of course 12 hours was a two-day work two-day workshop the one on laughter is done for usually one to six hours in length. 
Now, if you had told me when I was in high school or undergrad that I would one day be paid to speak in public, I would say you are totally insane. But now, you may ask, how can a person with a speech issue conduct workshops and sim and seminars? My pro my programs are not lecture based; they're experiential. We get up and do it. We uh, we do role play acti ac ac activities, and then we will process them and say, "How is this like life?" In 1985, I married a wonderful lady. Eight months after the marriage, we bought our first we bought our first house which can be a very stressful experience. The night of the day, I signed the papers to buy my first house. I had, when I was asleep, I had my first grandma seizure. It scared my ex-wife to death. The next day, I made an appointment to see an appointment to see a neurologist. He told me that my seizure was the result of my traumatic brain injury. He told me that I would never be able to cope with stress. I would never be able to withstand as much as other people can. I will always need rest at the end of the day. All the things, all of the things he said to me, I knew, but had never heard someone express them. Nor was I ever able to express them. And uh, I learned that it's no wonder I couldn't because the very thing we use to express ourselves, the brain is what's damaged. The neurologist prescribed, prescribed an anti-convulsant to control my seizures. And the meds have worked. There were a few times I was stupid enough to get myself off the meds and these seizures would return. I was doing fine. I thought, well, I'm doing okay. Guess I can get off the meds now. Now I worked in uh, chemical dependency for off and on for for 15 years. The biggest reason for people who come out and come out of treatment and have a relapse is they quit going to meetings, be it AA, NA, or CA. And the reason they quit going to meetings is because the meetings work. Well, I'm, I'm, I haven't drank or haven't used in so long. I think I can, I can slack off now. That's when the, that's when they relapse. Also, there were some times, even though I was taking the meds, severe stress can cause. A seizure. Now, all of mine have been grandma have, have all been noc noc nocturnal when I'm asleep. Thank God, because I hate to be in a car and then, and then have and then have one. In 1987, my first son was born. Being a dad is the best title I've ever had. In the mid 1980s, 
I began doing conducting the workshops on a national level. I was advised to earn a doctoral degree in adult and continu continuing education to make my workshops and seminars more marketable. Marketable. That's a mouthful. So in 1989, I moved my family from Jackson, Mississippi to Hattiesburg and began my work on a PhD in adult education. I was going to school full time at night and working full time. In 1990, our second son was born. He was born with no complications. At six weeks old, he had to have an operation for pyloric stenosis. He was unable to keep food down. At three and a half months old, we learned he had cataracts, which is very, very rare for an infant. He had to have two operations on his operations on his eyes to have his lens re, lens removed. My ex-wife had to put in contacts twice a day. He couldn't have implants because he, he couldn't talk. He couldn't say, I see the big the big E. So the doctor had to guess on the strength of the of the contacts. But Drew, my son, could see much better wearing the contacts that my wife had to put him in twice a day. On his first birthday, we learned he had an, an enlarged heart and enlarged liver. He caught a virus, Coxsackie B, from the air or something he touched, we don't know. And uh, he lived six more, six more months and died in my wife's arms at my in-law's house. That was, the mo that was the most stressful experience of my life. <clears throat> in December, 1992, I completed my doctoral, doctoral work. In the early 1990s, I came across excerpts from a book by Dr. Roland Parker from the New York Medical College. The book was enti is entitled Traumatic Brain Injury and Neuropsychological Impairment. It was captivating. The excerpts were just like it was me. My ex, my ex wife said, Greg, this is you to a T. I had to order the book. The book was $89. I have a problem saying that $89. Now, this was in the early 1990s. It was worth every. That's called a block, every penny. Um, it was as, as if Dr. Parker was reading my mind. I read the book and sent a letter to Dr. Parker at the New York Medical C C C College. A few days later, my phone rang. It was Dr. Parker. We had, I mean, we began a uh, relationship, a professional relationship. And he asked me, he was very cordial and asked me, did I know the definition of a mild brain injury? I said, no, I don't. He said, it's the type that happens to the other fellow. I compare a mild brain injury to being a little pregnant. In December of 1995, I began, began a new job 
at Mississippi State Hospital outside of Jackson. If you've seen, if you have seen the movie, A Time to Kill, part of it was filmed at Mississippi State Hospital. It's a uh, inpatient state hospital for people with mental disorders. It also has two buildings for people with chemical dependencies. During that time, I attended monthly meetings of a TBI support group. It was good to hear from others facing the same challenges, challenges, challenges as his mind. I retired in 2015. I've had one seizure in 20 years. A good friend of mine, Dr. Dale Henry, who's a professional speaker and did his doctoral work with me, advised me to write a book about overcoming adversity. And I did. I've written a book, it's called uh, Rise Above Conquering Adversities. And Cardi, I think you were going to show that. Uh, maybe you are showing it. Uh, now, it will never be a bestseller, but it, thus far it's sold in seven, seven countries. And I'm rather proud of, uh, proud of that. Proud of that. It details my, t my TBI as well as how I became a public speaker and touches on my touches on my bereavement journey. Now, some things to expect after a TBI. I say this knowing most of survivors are already experiencing experiencing these things. Anxiety, depression. Major depression is a frequent comp complication of TBI that hinders a patient's reco recovery. The number one health problem in the world today is stress. Half the beds in an, in an acute care hospital are filled with, are filled with people with stress-related Ill, Ill illnesses, high blood, high blood pressure, ulcers, heart disease, cancer. Stress can weaken our immune si system, making it, making it easier for us to fall sick. In the early 1990s, my anxiety and depression levels were diagnosed at very high percentiles. I was prescribed meds for anxiety and, de and depression. Both meds have been helpful in taking the, ed the, taking the edge off not completely taken away anxiety and depression but making them making them manageable manageable another issue tbi survivors face is poor short-term me me memory poor short-term memory memory is so complex it defies definition. There is no part of the brain that does not involve mem memory. If I'm uh, if I'm under a great deal, deal of stress, if I'm under a great deal of stress, my memory virtually 
shuts down. Practically, practically all my job evaluations, all my job evaluations have mentioned my poor memory. <clears throat> and all but one of these evaluations were while working in mental health facilities. It's no wonder TBI is, has been referred to as a silent epidemic. The only, the only professionals I've met who know anything about TBI are those who work in neurology. Now, I mentioned my neurosurgeon saying to me, that I'm gonna be all right, I'm gonna be fine. I asked my neurologist why he would say that and not say, now you've got to learn to live with it. He told me that for a neural sur sur surgeon, for you to be able to get it and walk across, walk across the room, you've come light years. This one is huge. Poor impulse control. One of the main things the brain does, if not the main thing the brain does, is tell us what not to do. We have teeny tiny inhibitors in the brain that allow us to pause for a split second before we say or do things that would, that would otherwise be inappropriate. If those inhibitors are severed from an insult to the brain, we will lose that split second and say or do things that are socially in, up, in appropriate. This can destroy relationships because people do not see that it's a physical problem. <clears throat> now, this is much easier said than done, but for TBI survivors who are hearing what I'm saying right now about the short-term memory issues, one thing to do is learn to forgive yourself. There's some things that are physical and you, it doesn't mean it's okay. It's just that you're faced with a huge, task to try to overcome something that is physical. Hope that makes sense. Um, reading social feed feedback. This can play havoc on relationships as well. We often will misread one's intent by thinking they don't care or taking their actions, or we take their actions to the extreme. And this happened to this has happened to me more times than I can even begin to count. <clears throat> I mentioned dysarthria, which affects the muscles around the mouth, which can result in slurring and can affect our articulation. That's why it's important to try to articulate our words. Seizures. All steps should be taken to control seizures. But fatigue. We're more, more apt, we are more apt to be tired at the end of the day. Also, it can be hard to get up in the morning. I know of a TBI survivor who works in the uh, works who is, who is employed in insurance, and they understand his issues with getting up in the morning. And he arrives to work whenever he whenever he can, and they totally understand that. Relationships. It can be very difficult 
to live with someone with all of these characteristics. I strongly advise, I strongly advise a TBI survivor and his or her significant other to get involved with TBI support groups. At ours that we had in Jackson, we would often have guest speakers come in and uh, do an educational session or he just have just have just have general cheering emotions not being able to show emotions or taking emotions to the extreme we can have a, a as if we have no a, no effect concentration focusing attention on a task or one discussion for a lengthy period of time can be an enormous, enormous task. Sound sensitivity. When I was initially, when I was discharged from the hospital for, I would say a year or two, I was easily distracted by any sound. Now that's, I, that can happen to me now, but not, close to the way it did when I first was discharged from the hospital. Light sensitivity, that can be an, an issue. Chronic pain. Exercise is good. Uh, of course, that's, that's good for us, for us all, but uh, any, any type of range of motion is good, is good, is good for that. Having to learn with a new brain, that's our life for now and out. There's not one day that goes by, one hour that goes by, that I don't think about my TBI. And now this is not a consequence, but a bit of advice. Avoid negative people when they when possible and don't worry about what other people are thinking of you they are not thinking of you you are not the center of the universe they're thinking about themselves and what and what other people are thinking about them a tbi survivor needs to know that he or she is often limited by his or her ability to adapt. Now, if you have Instagram on your, and I'm sure that most people do, Instagram, there's a source, a really good source, it's called TBI underscore me. And a TBI survivor, Ariel Johnson, throughout the week, posts brief videos of excellent, excellent educational material for TBI survivors. To learn, to learn, plus tax, to learn more about my TBI or more things I've mentioned today, you can go to my website, drgregdlittle.com and look at my, look at my uh, blogs or anything else, drgregdlittle.com. Now I will address any quick questions anyone has. I was wondering if you can spell that. Are you talking about that website, Skip? Is that what you want him to spell? Or that uh, email? It's, can you go to, go to my website? Can you go to my website? No, it, you said some kind, something about some kind of euphoria. Oh, euphoria? What is it? Who said that? She or I said Joshua, that. Like that? Euphoria? No. No. Is that something to do with your speech? Dysarthria. 
Oh, just all three. Out. Yes. Okay. Uh, That's a good example of it, of it there. I should have. I think have, it's uh, like this. I, can, I might want to Google it. I don't know. Don't yeah. Okay. I think it's some kind of like, I, let me just double check that. It's a fix. In the, yeah, the there's, an R, there's another there. R in there. It looks like I missed. Yeah, just all three. Yeah. R three. Oh, okay. That, that's what it is. Yeah. Here, sorry. I'm, yeah. There I we go. Articulate. Yeah. 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 Just okay. Thank you. I'll have to look that up. Difficult or unclear articulation of speech. Articulation of speech. Oh, yeah. Okay. The muscles used for speech, which often causes slowed or slurred speech. Yeah. A lot of our survivors will say, you know, people think I sound intoxicated. So I would say that would be like their dysarthria. Exactly. Okay. That I have problems at that occasionally. Do you? Yeah. My, yeah. my speech. My speech. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Have your grand mal seizures slowed down, or do you still have them frequently? Oh, they slowed in. They have slowed in immensely. I have not had one in. Uh, in over in over 10 years uh i'm retired now and i have very little very little stress and that's helped that has helped uh, a great deal that's helped a great deal You talked about, um, oh, sorry, water bottle fell. Um, you talked about your family kind of, you know, oh, that's been so long, you know, kind of let it go. How do you, any ideas on how, how to give people to handle that with family or? Oh, listen, I thought of that. I, that's, that's a good thing to ask. I've thought of that so much that, uh, well, I guess trying to ex compare a TBI, like I said, to a buying a used car. Yeah. You know, once the car is wrecked, it's never. Once a car has been in a, in an accident, it's never the same, and the brain is the same is the same way. Yeah. Once it's wrecked, it's never quite the same. Yeah, I wrote that down. That was a good way of explaining a brain injury. But you know, yeah. Yeah, I wish I had, wish I knew uh, if, he, if anybody has an uh, an idea of what to say to them. I'm all I'm all ears because uh, they just cannot relate because they've not experienced it. Uh, I don't know. Okay. You know. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, I just wondered if you had any success with them at all. Anyway, no, uh, well, well, uh, now my ex wife and my son know because they had to live with it, they had to live with live with me, and they uh, they face my, my, my ex wife, um, she understood because she lived through the seizures and all, mm -hmm. and my uh, anxiety depression so she knows it's she knows it's real the emotional Un side, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, both sides i suppose and he does and my son does as well he's married to a nurse now and uh so uh, that helps him to relate sure that's good i've also heard comparing it to um iphones like you you know someone with a brain injury is operating on like an iphone 3 and the rest of us are up to a 12 now so it still works it still charges it just takes longer to charge it might not be able to to you know have new apps on it but it has some apps you know like so there's i don't know that's kind of a one way we'll explain it every once in a while too to people as far as but i like that yeah that's, a good, that's good 
good and that good and and allergy yeah i think it's good and just that yes i like that it all still works and everything's good it's just a little slower and takes longer all of that so hi uh greg um hello this is uh shelly i'm just one of the participants today i was able to meet carly this morning and i was introduced to the brain injury network um, my role um, in being on here is that I am a nurse for oh, about 30 years, but I've recently become a stroke coordinator in a facility in North Dakota. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I actually have um, some, some family members that have had brain injuries. Um, one of them is a brother-in-law to, to, my, to my son. Um, and this young man is I mean, your story, I, I need to make sure that I have your book. I, I You said Rise Above. Rise what, Above. I'm sorry. Yep, go ahead. Rise, ab rise Above con Conquering Adversities. Conquering Adversities. Rise okay. Above. Thank you. Conquering, yeah. Okay. Um, because this young man, um, it is the freakiest accident that happens. He was with a number of individuals, um, college kids, um, just graduated college, and they were on a balcony of an apartment um, outside, and and um, God was looking out for these kids because a fire a fire truck was at the apartment because an elevator was stuck, and they all went out onto the balcony to look down at this fire department coming and um and when they were on the balcony the balcony collapsed and it was 20 feet, a, a 20 foot drop i believe um um several of them were injured quite badly um this brother-in-law of my son's um of course he was 22 he he landed on the pavement and his aorta was ripped to oh. to near shreds so he, he ended up having surgery, he had broken his arm, it, it was, they couldn't find his elbow, his, his leg was broken, his femur was sticking out. Um, um, he lived because that, that fire department was there on site already. Um, so he was, he was emergently taken to the hospital and thus then through all of that, he had a stroke. When he came to, after multiple surgeries, his parents were told then that in one of the recovery days and in the huddle for him as to what his progress was doing, they were told that he had sustained a stroke. And so that, that is his debilitation more so. I mean, he, he now is getting his arm redone. Um, he just had some surgery done. This is two years ago. He had some surgery done so he can get some more movement out of his arm. Um, but the, the majority of that problem with his arm is because it was structurally jam damaged so bad. But one thing is, is his aphasia and his dysarthria arthria is very bad. Um, right. and some days are better than others. But um, you have come so far. You're amazing. And you know, you just kind of look to me what 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 this young man will look like when he ages because he has thick white, thick blonde hair and He's rosy. Um, I don't know if you're Norwegian. You look Norwegian to me, but but um, I I just think that you're very inspiring and would bring him great hope because he's really working hard. He went to a facility in um, Colorado. He went to Craig's Hospital and he lived there for a number of months, and so he got extremely great therapy. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think I, I I you know I try to support his mother you know, cause she's the mother-in-law to my son and we live in the area and I, she, they, they're, they're kind of a stoic family. So it's hard to know what you can talk about and what you can't, right. you know? So I, you saying that it's hard for people to understand is, is so very, very true, you know? Um, mm. But what, what would you advise? What would you give as advice to people looking in on you years ago? Is it easier to talk about it or? Uh. I mean, to, for me to, to talk about my T, my TBI or people's reaction to it. Yeah. I'm not, 
Well, kind of people's reaction to it. Like, you know, I sometimes, you know, it's like you want to ask how you're doing, you know, or you want to let them be just like everyone else. But, you know, they are different. Their day is different than your day. Um, uh, you know, as, as when you support people. Oh, that, okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry. I'm trying to get the your get your, your. So what do you say to them? What what, what not, do you? I'm so sorry, I'm not, no, that's okay. I mean, I'm just what I'm asking is is if you were um, together with family and and you said people don't understand the TBI. You know, I mean, it's like you can't. It's really difficult to understand what you're being in your shoes. Is it? Yeah is it more comfortable to just to to not really ask the person how they're doing or oh, or it, it's fine it's it, I, I i would i would yeah. ask them yeah because 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 nobody thinks there's a need to know how they how they how they're how they're doing often yeah but there is a need exactly yes there's a need yeah. and uh People want to be heard. The the key I learned this years ago from Dr. Don Kirk, Dr. Don Kirk Kirkley, who taught public speaking at the pit at the pit the Pentagon. I'm going too fast now. I'm sorry. No, he you're said, fine. He said the key to effective communication, the hardest part, is listening. Mm -hmm. When we listen to someone, we give them worth. Mm -hmm. And they in turn will give worth to what we say to them. But this gentleman needs to be heard. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to care about how he how he's doing, how he feels. Mm -hmm. Because does he uh, because people often uh, like I say cannot relate. Yeah. And uh, they just think, well, he's got a broken body, but he feels like me. Well, he mm -hmm. he doesn't. He's living and he's living with a new brain. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, because I I know my, my my son often says to him, Mom, I don't know what to say sometimes. So I say to him, it was really good to see you um, and come over any time. Cause they live close by now they, yeah. they've moved back home so his so the sister can support him because she was the closest sibling in age it was catastrophic yeah. what happened i mean just terrible oh, yeah. i mean this happened this happened a few years ago right yeah just three just two years ago i remember it i remember it when, do you yes ma'am i do i promise you yeah, I, on, on, I remember seeing seeing that on the news. Yes, yeah, there was five kid, five young people on one balcony, and and yes, it was it was it was really devastating, and it's amazing that that they're all alive, and especially him, because right. his injuries were quite extreme. But he's do, they're doing well. Most of them have all recovered back to their normal yeah. life, you know, to living life with yeah. within their abilities and and you know they you know therapies are extensive and they're great and people are really flourishing in their new way yeah one thing yeah. Uh, one of our survivors has mentioned with her family this is a much lighter way to address it but her father has always been really the kind of the same way greg as you said your family was like oh that was a long time ago you're fine you know mm -hmm. um she has our playing cards so we offer free decks of playing cards that you can order and there's a fact about brain injury on each card and so her and her dad will play cards with those cards and then use oh. those facts to kind of mm. explain her injury because it'll say you know one says you know, wearing sunglasses might help you with vision stuff or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. kind of different mm -hmm. tips and, yeah. And so she, um, I will put in the chat the link for you to order the cards, but yeah, um, they're free and we just mail them out. We'll mail you a deck to wherever mm -hmm. you'd like, but 
um, we've, we've had, I know one in particular say that it worked really well for helping educate her family. So that might be an option. Thank for you. Family. Yeah, that would be, yeah. that would be nice. I know the family plays cards often. So, oh, perfect. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of a lighter way to talk about some deeper. Yeah. Things. Yeah. That's good. I've never heard of that, but that's, that is smart. Mm-hmm. I can't take credit for it. That's our director and our one of our interns, I think, wrote all of the um, the facts and everything, but they've been so popular. We've talked about making like uh, multiple versions of the decks and things. Um, other states have, have borrowed the template for us and from us and stuff. So yeah, it's, um, it's good. Well, thank you. It was, it was you. great to be on and meet you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I plan to follow you. <laughs> I did get another question. So Skip is asking about um, your when you talked about stress causing memory loss. Are you kind of talking about brain fog? She says sometimes I forget the words to say. Is that more of a um, fog or I don't. Uh, I would say probably no, but you did. But that does remind me, I, I will, let me address that first. I think it's just, if, I'm, if, if it's enormous stress, my memory just shuts down. I, it could be brain fog. It could, it could be, I'm not too familiar with that definition. Uh, I've heard of that, but I, I just cannot give you a, an, an intelligent answer to that. But um, I can recall when I get out of the hospital, my speech, I could see a chair. And I think that is a, and then uh, I could hear the word chair in my brain, in my brain, and, uh, but I did not know how to make, move my mouth to make the word chair come, come out. In about six seconds afterwards, chair would come out. But I, that is a chair. That is a desk. It's I don't know what that's called, but that's um, they don't have that now, of course. But uh, I think that's that a word finding type. Yeah, just finding words can be hard. I think even for people yeah. a lot later on. I've word heard finding. That... Oh, you're muted, Skip. Sorry. Skip, you're muted. Okay, the finding words, that's about the same thing I feel. Um, I'm talking and all of a sudden my, I just, it disappeared. Right, yes. And I feel embarrassed, I feel frustrated, I can't finish what I was saying. So that's what I thought was brain fog, but I guess it's, you call it disappearing the words? Yeah, word finding, pro I, I think of brain fog more as a, low moving kind of like actual like feels like they're in a fog kind of oh. like a state of mind almost okay or, uh, like a depression kind of thing like a i don't know that's the way i always thought brain fog meant but it might mean different things to different people too skip have you ever tried speech at all no we should do a referral for you i don't know it might be worth a try Okay. Um, it sounds like speech was helpful for Greg. And now with, with telehealth, because um, Skip is in one of our very rural areas. Um, there isn't a lot of services out where she's at in the um, western side of our state. And um, but now with telehealth, you can do speech and all the, you know, a lot of therapies like we're doing right now. You know, the speech pathologist would be on the other end of the screen and doing some of those activities Greg was mentioning, you know. Um, oh, really? How yeah. long, Greg, how long did you have to go for speech therapy? I uh, went, let's see, in Tupelo. I would say two, well, well now, I went for a, for the one at UMC, I went for a year, 52 weeks. <laughs> one hour a week, 52 weeks. Once a week for an hour. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. once a week. Wow. I went for a while when in like the same period. I, I'm sorry, what now? 
I went for a while in the mid seventies uh, and in Tupelo, but uh, she was just just addressing stuttering, which is not really the issue I have. And uh, the new therapist, I've been, I've seen several speech therapists over the years, but I finally found one who knew the problem problems I have. And sometimes you you have to find a therapist who fits with you. And this and this gentleman did. He did a I was very pleased with the results. Oh, thank you. So, Carly, this would be would be this online thing you talk about. Is that once a week, or do you? It have would be up to what you and, and probably what your insurance would cover. If you, depending on if you wanted to pay private or yeah, we can talk. Um, give me a call, Skip. Let's talk about that. It would be what works for you, but yeah, and and what insurance covers and all of that, and there's a lot of details that go into it. But if if I could pick a related therapy, a related service provider that I feel like is most beneficial to most of our survivors and nothing against our OTs and PTs and all that, I would say speech language pathology, because really, I honestly think it should be, and Sanford is, Sanford Health in, Grant, in North Dakota is kind of doing a good job of this, and they're calling it cognitive therapy more than they're calling it speech, because I think a lot of times people hear speech and they think, well, I speak fine, because a lot of, you know, um like skip you speak okay it's just your word finding greg you speak fine it's not really your articulation it's your cognitive process that's going on inside you know it's, it's a it's a cognitive thing usually and um so they really work on that piece of it and they're not necessarily like you know skip say this you know they're not working on you the way you speak but it as far as the way your brain processes speech and the way it comes out okay so I, I think it would be worth a try. Um, and yeah, we can explore some options for you. But I know of several agencies or several clinics um, in North Dakota that have certified brain injury specialists as their speech pathologists. And so I would recommend those ones too, just because they know a little more about brain injury. The speech pathology has a huge range. You can be a speech pathologist with preschoolers. You can be with college kids. You can be with a uh, hospital setting it's really all over the place so um we like to recommend ones that are have a little extra training in brain injury so they can work on those executive functioning skills which would be like the things greg mentioned as far as like memory and impulsivity and those kinds of things are those more of those executive functioning areas okay thank but, you guys yeah, give me a call and we'll we'll work on that a little, you know, okay some thank you greg it was great great listening Yes, thanks. Oh, okay. You have a great Thank story you. and you're brave to share it and it was good to hear it, I think. And uh, your book, yeah, we'll have to get your book in our collection. In that. Our collection for sure. Any other questions or comments or anything you have for Greg before we let you all go? Great job. Thanks for sharing. Very, Thank you very much. I love that where you said, when we listen to someone, we give them worth. That is right. an awesome quote. Yeah. Right. Thank you. People yeah. need, to, need to feel worth. They need to feel worth. And by listening to them, we give them worth. Yeah, that's a great line. I'm writing that one down too. Okay, guys, I think that's all for today. We'll let you take breaks. And um, you got a comment. Thanks so much, Greg. I wish you all the best from Charlotte. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Greg. Okay. We'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye bye.